Here in Eretz Yisrael, we have a unique experience. We can do something here that you have to come here to this spot to do. We are talking about a wall from 1150 BC. There's a reason Jesus wept over this city from here on the Mount of Olives. He knew what was coming. On behalf of the village, I'd like to welcome you to Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus. Most of his ministry took place right here. Behold, the city of Beit Shan. I know it doesn't look like much. In fact, it kind of looks like a pile of dusty rocks. But because of its fertile valleys, easy access to water, and placement between two major trade routes, Beit Shan was one of the most sought after cities in all of ancient Israel. Civilizations like the Egyptians, the Maccabees, the Romans, even the Crusaders all wanted a piece of the action. Because if you wanted to control Israel, you better believe you needed Beit Shan. With its destructive war-torn history, Beit Shan's final end may actually surprise you. Beit Shan was not destroyed in any war, in this war. That's Sion Ben David, you know, from the intro. It was destroyed in, in 749 by an earthquake. And you can see the sign. Now take a look. You don't need an imagination. There were columns here right. with pillars. Column with pillars. And you can see the arches. See one, two, three. No doubt due to the earthquake just collapsed down. As you can see, so it was a beautiful, beautiful street here taking you to the car. The cardo is there. See it? We're going to walk soon in the cardo. By day, what is a cardo? What is a cardo? Cardiologist. What's a cardiologist? Heart. Heart. The heart of the city. That's called a cardo, okay? Remember that. Think of a cardo as a sort of main street that cuts through the center of town. Most cardos formed an X in the middle of the city, with the center of the X being the hub of political and economic activity. Let's go to Tzion on one of the main cardos in the ancient city of Beit Shan. We are walking on Cardo Silvanus, south, north. But something interesting happened here, not like usual uh, Cardo. Here, it didn't have a cross, crossroad. It went here to the east, and one of the gates used to be there. And only there it went to the west. Did you, do you understand what I mean? It came from north. It come there, went right a little bit more, and then went left, and it continued to the south. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. Now take a look the sizes of these pillar there, and you can understand definitely this was destroyed by an earthquake. Highly desired, oddly designed, and crumbled by an earthquake. Beit Shan is shaping up to be quite the interesting spot. Don't go anywhere though. We have more to explore here on our journey to Israel. We're surrounded by a terrible adversary who wants our destruction. I think our adversary is constantly assaulting our mind. Satan has no right to damage you or continue his wicked assault. Lord Jesus is calling us today to oppose the devil with prayer. We shouldn't be afraid that, that we're going to run out of our king's resources because they are endless. We just have to make sure that we're doing his bidding. We're doing what he wants us to do. We're doing it in the way he wants us to do it. And then he will equip and provide because he is good. His mercy endures forever. His resources are endless. God is on our side in any conflict with the devil. In any conflict between God and the devil, God wins, the devil loses. Welcome back to Beit Shan. Thanks for sticking it out through our commercials. Let's jump straight to Zion as he tells us more about the modern living arrangements of the people of Beit Shan. Well, modern by their standards, anyway. Now, actually, people until the 4th century BC, approximately, 
they lived on tells. When did people stop living on tells? You have to remember, it was quite limited. How many people could live here? In the Greek, exactly, in the Greek time, Hippodamus was the first architect maybe in the world who started planning cities. And what was his typical system of, of building streets? The squares. 42nd Street, you're, no matter what, it's all squares. But this is called an insula or hippodamus. If they wanted to build a huge public construction, they took few insulas and they built it on top of it. By the way, there are many, many architects today. Manhattan, it is a typical hippodamus or system. So they moved down here and this became a Acropolis, the upper city defending this entire city, okay? And we are looking at the tell which civilization started actually 600,000 BC. Later on, Zion explains to us exactly what a tell is and how one's formed. Try to imagine if every time a building was demolished, we simply used the rubble as the foundation for the next one. Now imagine what would happen if that occurred over the course of several years we'd end up with a building on top of a pretty large mound of dirt and debris. That's exactly how a tell is formed. Every time a settlement was destroyed by an invading army or natural disaster, the townspeople would simply build over the top of the wreckage. Over time, this rubble got more and more dense and the buildings would get higher and higher off the ground. That's why archaeologists see tells as historical gold mines, because they contain many layers of ancient architecture that stretch further and further back in history the lower you dig. Of course, it's not the, the, the most ancient because in, in Megiddo we've got 26, some must say 30, 26 layers of, of civilization. Now, again, when we speak about King Saul, King Saul was killed in the mountain where they are standing approximately there. They brought his body after he was killed. They brought him in the walls of Beit She'an. It's an incredible experience to walk in a location like Beit She'an. But to know that some thousands of years ago, King Saul's body was hung from these very walls makes it all the more surreal. Let's hear more from Dr. Weiss on Saul's death and David's astonishing reaction to the news. You know, the history that is relevant to scripture relates to King Saul. But I think the events that took place with King Saul and King David, uh, there's so much that we can learn. There's a couple of concepts I want you to think about, and then I'll just read the scripture to you. The first thing I want to say is that when God's anointed falls, two things happen. The people of God are confused. And number two, the enemies of God are emboldened. They move in, they take over, and they occupy. When God's anointed falls, it's tragic. And that's what happened here. King Saul had been anointed. He was the king chosen by God to lead the children of Israel, to lead the Jewish people. And it was here that God's anointed. It was the end of his life. Now, he had fallen earlier from a spiritual standpoint. But I'm pointing this out because I want you to think in terms of what it means to have the enemies of God emboldened, for the enemies of God to move in, take over, and occupy. Hold up there, Dr. Weiss. In case you missed it, he's teaching us about the horrific consequences of someone anointed by God falling spiritually or physically. Why is he telling us this? Because Beit Shan is the place where the anointed of God, King Saul, fell. His body was hung from these very walls, and the results of his defeat were tragic. Make sense? Good. Let's continue. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 13, it, it, there's a parable that Jesus tells, and he says, Occupy till I come. That word occupy has kind of a militaristic uh, flavor to it like an occupation force. Uh, after World War II was reaching the end of, of uh, the conflict, America sent in occupation forces 
to help protect the innocent, to help restore order, to make sure that there wasn't chaos. My, my uncle, who passed away just in, in uh, uh, the last uh, two weeks here in Israel, he served in the occupation force. He was the youngest brother of the ten children of my grandparents. In the circumstance of a bitter conflict where there is a war and winners come in, the winners come in and they occupy, in some cases it's just to turn it back over to the people who were there. That's what we did in World War II. We occupied with occupation forces until it could, peace could be uh, insured and restored and then you know, Japan went back to the Japanese and my uncle, my, my uncle went home. He was the, the last of the brothers in the conflict. In the context of the people of God, I want you to understand that when we are in a spiritual conflict and when God's anointed falls and the people are confused and our enemies are emboldened and they move in and take over, they're not going to give it back. They're not going to return what was taken. And I would hope that none of us would be willing to give up territory won by the blood of the Lamb. So that's the spiritual concept I want you to think about. And it is for that reason I want to ask you to pray for your pastors. Pray for godly leaders in your nations. Pray for God's anointed to be strong because when God's anointed fall the people are confused and the enemy moves in. Now I'm going to read to you from 1 Samuel chapter 31. The Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. You saw across the valley Mount Gilboa and now we are here. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. The Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul and the archers hit him and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, draw thy sword. Thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. When the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side of Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled, that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. When God's anointed falls, there's confusion. The people are confused. The enemy moves in. The enemy is emboldened. They occupy. They take over. It came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa and they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Beit Shan where we are. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beit Shan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. When God's anointed falls, it's not only the individual. It's not only the individual's family, it's also the valiant warriors who stand with 
that anointed servant. The valiant warriors put their lives at risk to come and somehow find a way to restore whatever amount of honor could be preserved for this fallen anointed king. We've learned about ancient dirt hills, mountains where people died, and how square streets are still used today. There's still more to come though. Please stay tuned. We're surrounded by a terrible adversary who wants our destruction. I think our adversary is constantly assaulting our mind. Satan has no right to damage you or continue his wicked assault. The Lord Jesus is calling us today to oppose the devil with prayer. We shouldn't be afraid that, that we're going to run out of our king's resources because they are endless. We just have to make sure that we're doing his bidding. We're doing what he wants us to do. We're doing it in the way he wants us to do it. And then he will equip and provide because he is good. His mercy endures forever. His resources are endless. God is on our side in any conflict with the devil, in any conflict between God and the devil. God wins, the devil loses. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Randy Weiss and I only have about 30 seconds to tell you about my brand new book, Pray, Fight, Win. Now, I know what you're thinking, what's the book about? It's about going on the offensive. It's about giving the devil the old one-two with your prayers. But it is so much more than that. It's a journey that we take together to find the deeper meanings within the righteousness of Christ and the treachery of the devil. I hope you'll check it out. Welcome back to Bait Sean. Just in case you were completely enthralled by our commercials, here's a quick recap. Dr. Weiss has just finished telling us the story of King Saul's death and how his body was hung from the walls of Beit Shan, where we are currently. Soldiers, loyal to Israel, then recovered his body and gave it a proper burial. Now let's hear the rest of the story from the perspective of the soon-to-be King David. It's a tragedy when God's anointed falls. Those who seek to protect the legacy are at risk. Pray for your pastors, pray for your leaders. Now, what I've read is the end of 1 Samuel. They took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. But the fact is that it's not the end of the story. It's the end of 1 Samuel, but it picks back up in 2 Samuel. And here we learn that what really was experienced was a botched suicide. It came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came even to pass on the third day that behold a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. He was, he was uh, earth on his head. He, he was mourning. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. Now, let's remember that David was an enemy. to Saul considered David his enemy. I don't think David considered Saul in the same light. Uh, David respected the anointing of God, the call of God. David was an honorable man. He understood. It's not to say that he could call Saul his friend because he knew Saul was out to kill him. He was best friends with Saul's son. David's asking the question, how did the war go? His best friend was on the front line with his father who was coming to get him.
How went the matter, I pray thee, tell me? And he answered, The people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? I mean, are you sure? Are you sure? Is the man who has been chasing me, who's been trying to kill me, is he really dead? And is the man that I love, his son, Jonathan, is he really, really dead? The young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear. And lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me. And I answered, Here am I. Saul had tried to kill himself but he was unsuccessful. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. Uh, in the Septuagint it says, For I am seized with a gloomy horror because all my life is in me. Can you imagine what was going through that man's mind? His kingdom was lost. His family was, was slaughtered. He had tried to destroy his own life and couldn't even pull it off. And the enemy is riding in on top of him. And that which he feared was about to come upon him. He was afraid that the enemy was going to arrive, find him alive, and abuse him. It was a botched suicide. And so this man is now reporting to King David, so I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them hither unto my Lord. No doubt that man was expecting a great reward. He was fully convinced that he was coming to David who Saul had been chasing to kill and a lot of people felt that Saul was David's enemy. I don't think David felt that way. David still knew that this was the anointed king of Israel. But even his own troops, his own soldiers couldn't understand what it meant to submit to the authority that God brings into one's life and to honor God's anointed. But David understood it. This man, this Amalekite, was certain he was about to get the reward of his life. And he did. He got the reward uh, that apparently, in God's sight, was due to him. Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. This is like as in the weeping and gnashing, you know, this is the weeping and rending of one's garment. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan, his son. They were uh, sitting short shiva. Sitting shiva is the Jewish tradition of sitting down in mourning. It usually lasts about seven days. David and his men did it in one night. That's why Dr. Weiss said they were sitting short shiva. I know it's not funny if I have to explain it, but I didn't want you to miss out on his joke. Okay, let's continue. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger and a Melechite. David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. David is asking this man, what gave you the right? And I would ask that question here today. What gives anyone the right 
what gives anyone the right to go and destroy themselves or to help someone destroy themselves? And especially the anointed of God. David called one of the young men and said, Go near, fall upon him, and he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. I don't know your views about life and death. I don't know your views about the sanctity of life. But I believe, I believe God has a view that he is opposed to self-destruction, to suicide. I believe he's opposed to euthanasia, to helping people destroy themselves. And I believe God's heart is that we would protect life. We should protect the lives of the innocent. And barring the, the legal system, I mean, allow the legal system to work. There's a system of justice in place that goes all the way back to Moses. Allow, allow the legal system to work. But we don't take those things, we don't take those we don't take life into our own hands to destroy it. We, we are to protect life. And the whole notion of destroying the unborn is sickening. And it will bring down the judgment of God. It's just a question of time. And the notion of because someone is not fully viable in someone else's opinion, nobody knows the power of God what he's intending to do in a person's life. This Amalekite could just as easily have said, Oh, King Saul, let me see if there's anything I can do to help. There was so much fear that had just completely dominated the circumstance. So much fear. King Saul had so much failure. And it was all at the surface now. And he was so afraid he was just going to kill himself before somebody else killed him. I'm not saying the Amalekite could have saved his life. I'm saying it would have been better than intentionally destroying his life. So that's what I wanted to have you consider. We should pray for the pastors, pray for the leaders, and that God's anointed won't fall, and we certainly won't help them self-destruct. Amen? Thank you. The story of Saul's death is just one of the many lessons we've learned here from Beit Shom. From ancient architecture, destructive earthquakes, and oddly placed card hose, Beit Shom is a truly memorable stop on our journey to Israel. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed learning about this deeply historic land. If you didn't already know, this is a viewer supported program. If you want to help us create more programs such as this, give us a call at 1-800-688-3422 or check us out online at crosstalk.org.